All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from YouTube. Lots of gems, lots of Chinese hopping vampires, and lots of stop making Bruce Lee a Mandarin speaker. Let's get to it. And every day, I practice martial arts. <laughs> Watch out. Yo, Dre, yo, Mikey, how you doing, man? Ooh, a bit of a Freudian slip there, Seagong. <laughs> I mean, I know Dre's been like kind of suburban dad in it, so maybe we're kind of beginning to look even more alike. Yeah, and also it's his birthday, and he decided for whatever reason he needed two or three days off for his birthday. And it's not even one of those golden ones like 40 or 50. It's 48. <laughs> I know, I know, right? You know who else's birthday it is today? Or yesterday, as it were? Dryson. Oh, well, I thought you were going to say Hitler, sorry. <laughs> which what? is also April 20th. <laughs> yeah, both of us might have a claim to that. I don't know. But, <laughs> but you know, and also Dr. Eisen, apparently. Oh, wow. All on the same day. I know, right? Incredible. Wow. Bit of a coincidence there. Well, I, think. I still only want to wish Dre a happy birthday. Screw all those other guys for all the <laughs> hours of pain and torment they caused me. So much pain and torment. Yes. Oh, dear God. So here we are uh, doing another classic style format episode of KFG without Dre. Um, mm -hmm. So we got uh, some questions. Uh, before we get started, just want to remind everyone that the best way to support the Kung Fu Genius podcast is on Patreon. So for as little as $5 a month, you get episodes early. You get my Instagram subscriber vids. Uh, absolutely for free. And every once in a while, I throw in some extra stuff in there. It's also the pipeline to get questions fast-tracked on the Kung Fu Genius podcast. We always give Patreon supporters uh, first dibs on, on questions. And, of course, it's an easy way to get a hold of me. Uh, I am on Instagram at the Kung Fu Genius. And I do spend, that's probably the social media outlet I spend the most time on. Uh, so it is possible to catch me there. But if you want to guarantee you have the direct line uh Patreon is the way to go. So what do you have for me today, sir? So what if you could transport back in time for a front row seat into the life and legacy of one of the most respected Wing Chun masters in history? Gong Sao Wong, a tribute. Direct students on Sifu Wong Sao Neng offers you just that. Through a series of exclusive conversations, 25 direct students share anecdotes, reflections, and personal stories offering in-depth understanding of the man behind the legend. Order your copy today across 12 Amazon marketplaces with free shipping. I absolutely love love this book and I think you'll find it an indispensable part of your collection. I can't recommend it enough. Get yours today. Go to Amazon, type in Gong Sao Wong and there you go. Well, we have a couple of Patreon questions off the bat. All right, let's do it. Okay, so our first Patreon question. Voodoo. Mm -hmm. It's actually a good question, I think. Uh -huh. Do you think the Wing Chun line will fade away after Lung Ting passes? In, in, in parenthesis, hopefully not anytime soon. Sorry, I say brackets because I'm lazy. Right. Um, I'm curious, since you know about the US, EU, and HK branches, thanks. Uh huh. It's parentheses, by the way. Oh, uh, you. Pa parenthesis? What kind of nonsense is that? Oh, parentheses. Yeah, right, next I'm just thing like... you're going to do is you're going to be spelling tire with a Y. Jeez. Well, I spell color uh. with a U. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well, that's a good question. It's a little, you know, obviously um, there's some politics involved in that stuff. Um, I, as, you know, as most of our listeners know, uh, ad nauseum, I've, I've pruned myself off of the the family tree of WT quite a bit, uh, quite, quite a long time ago. So I kind of extracted myself from that. Um, I've written a few articles for Wing Chun Illustrated on my thoughts about successors and, um, you know, which obviously the term grandmaster and successor, sometimes they're meant to mean the same. Sometimes they're separate things. I, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the whole idea of there being successors for an entire style. I think it's a little bit tricky, and I think um, it's especially problematic when a style has become so successful as WT did. I mean, right. when you have um, tens of thousands of people who are currently practicing WT at the moment, compounded with the tens of thousands who've practiced WT in the past just in Europe, um, you obviously have a number of highly qualified instructors, people who have a lot of experience, they're very knowledgeable, they, they know the style, they've been doing it for a long time. When you appoint one person as a successor, what does that mean for everyone else who's qualified? So I, I, the, the idea of a successor uh, or a keeper of the gate, a 
made sense in the old days when only a couple people learned the style to begin with. You right. know, the, the Sifu taught the student, the student taught one or two people. Then it was very easy. The successor should be the one with the most skill, the most knowledge, and, uh, you know, perhaps the person who was told to be the successor by the previous claimant to the throne, right? Um, but the problem is what happens now when you've taught a thousand students in your line? And you, let's say, out of those thousand people, 25 people could legitimately lay claim to being able to continue the style into the future. Right. And then you say, OK, but only one is a successor. So one of those 25 is the only one who can speak for the style after the death of the previous claimant to the throne. Right. Uh, then what does it mean for the other 24? Are they now suddenly disqualified from teaching? Are they now no longer legitimate because they're not the one successor? So I think the, the whole project of having a successor made sense in the old days when styles were really only taught to a small handful of people. And more often than not in those days, it was very clear who the successor was. It was the student, you know, when there's only five people training, uh, under a Sifu, over that Sifu's entire lifetime, it's usually kind of obvious who the leader is going to be. It's usually the one the Sifu likes the most. Um, but that then becomes untenable once you have big worldwide organizations. Um, Sifu Lengting, to a certain degree, tried to solve this problem through his ranking system. Right. But like most things with Sifu Lengting, he had a really great idea and he just lands on his face in the execution of the idea. <laughs> uh, when, you, when you read like, the, the outline of his uh, teaching program and, and ranking system in his book, Wing Chun Kun, you go, well, this is actually a very logical kind of way of doing things. Um, the problem is that he himself didn't stick to his own idea. Right. So, um, and, you know, I'll use the title Grandmaster because it, it, of how it relates to Sifu Lengting's ranking system. I personally don't think there should be any grandmasters anymore. I think anyone who's legitimately a grandmaster now uh, under Sifu Lengting, I think that's kind of where it should end. I think the next generation should throw that title in the garbage because right. I, I don't think it's meaningless. Uh, or I, I don't think it has any meaning. I think it is meaningless. Ah. And uh, I also think that in the wake of modern martial arts, mixed martial arts, all these kind of things here, I think it also kind of seems more and more silly to use these kind of titles um, and, and a bit presumptuous and pompous. And I think it, it's, it's anachronistic. It was something that made sense a long time ago. It doesn't really make sense anymore for the size and scope of Wing Chun. And it also doesn't make sense, in my opinion, culturally for the vibe of martial arts in the 21st century. I think it's kind of silly. Right. Um, so, so having said all that, <laughs> in in theory, Siva Lang Tang had this like had, has this ranking system. You have you have your twelve student levels where you're basically going through the Sunum Tao and Chumkyu level material, and then you have your technician ranks. The technician ranks are where an advanced practitioner is kind of learning the advanced stuff, Buji, wooden dummy, perhaps the weapons. Once they've learned this stuff, then you have the practitioner phase, which is like considered a master. That's generally in Lang Tang system. Uh, levels five through eight. So those are the masters that people have completed completed the system, even though that's a whole rabbit hole. You never, you never actually really end. Uh, you're always learning. You're always improving. But in terms of having learned the curriculum and having attained a certain level of mastery, those are your five through eights, the right. practitioners. Then after eight, you have nine through 12. Okay? It's based on 12. You have 12 student levels, and then you have these 12 higher levels, right? right. Um, 12 being a very auspicious number in Chinese. And so um, there's some other reasons to it. There's also an academic idea behind it. So, um, but, you know, for people who don't know or care about these ranking systems, you know, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll explain it from the, the, the ranking system side and then I'll explain it from a practical side. Um, after the eighth level, the nine through 12s, those are essentially considered the, the grand master levels, the higher, the, the, the highest of the highs, right? And Sifu Lengting, when he created his ranking system, made himself the 10th level in his own system. There's no bearing on his status in the greater Wing Chun world. This is just within his own school. And the 10th is supposed to be the current grandmaster of the WT style. Hence, Lengting, forming his own branch of Wing Chun, made himself that level. It makes sense. You know, for people who go, oh, he gave himself that level. Well, two things. One, there was never any ranking system in Chinese Kung Fu. And two, 
traditionally there was no ranking system in the other styles too. So at some point, some guy said, well, if we're going to create a ranking system and I'm the head, I got to be the eighth or the ninth or the tenth. Yeah. So you can throw shade on Leung Ting for giving himself a level, but then you would literally have to do that to any karate or jujitsu claimant who created their ranking system for themselves anyway. At some point, someone said, well, this is a ranking system. I'm the head guy. I'm pretty damn good, so I should be the top level. All yeah. right? It's just that when that happened in near history, people go, hey. <laughs> uh, but when it happened a long, long time ago, when no one saw it, no one says a thing, right? Yeah. But at some point, for all ranking systems, something like that happened. So if Siva Leung Ting was the 10th, the grandmaster, then what, are, what is 11 and 12 then? Well, 11 is supposed to be when the Grandmaster retires. Right. So retires, but is still alive and kicking. And then 12 is posthumous. All right. So the idea is that you only get the 12th once you're dead, which is why we've made the joke for all those like self-appointed Grandmasters in Europe. I said, why don't they just give themselves the 12th level, right? <laughs> so, but so, I, so, so to a certain degree, whether you agree with ranking systems or not, there was a logic to it. Then people say, well, what about ninth? Well, the ninth level is supposed to be the successor. Right. So it's actually very clear. Once you get the ninth, you are a grandmaster, but you are, cert you are to a certain degree the next one in line for 10. When you're 10th, you are the grandmaster of the WT style. 11th is when you retire, and 12th is when you're dead. All right? So, whether you like it or not, that, that's the logic behind it. Uh, great, straightforward system, because then this, then there would actually, this question would not exist had Sifu Langting stuck to his guns. Right. Uh, he's recently mostly retired, although he still does teach seminars because he unfortunately needs the cash at this point in his life. Um, technically, he should be 11th. They gave him the 11th in Europe, but Sifu Langting always says they gave him the 11th because they wanted him to stop teaching. <laughs> They're like, here, now you're the 11th because Sifu Kanchbe got the 10th, and that was the problem. Sifu Langting gave the 10th level to a few people while he was still the 10th. Right thereby kind of ruining his, the whole thing. Because technically, he should not give anyone the 10th until he becomes retired, the 11th. Okay? But the problem was he was the 10th, and then he gave the 10th to, to Sifu Kanchbe. He eventually gave it to Sifu Norbert Madai. And so now, or, or maybe Sifu Norbert is a ninth. I don't, I don't keep up anymore because honestly, I don't give a shit. I, <laughs> but I know that Sifu Norbert became a ninth. I don't know if Sifu Norbert is now also a tenth. I'd assume he's a tenth at the level that they were all kind of advancing. So the problem is now you have a bunch of people who are nines. Right. So you have multiple claimants to the throne. And now you have a few people who got the tenth from Sifu Lang Teng. Mm -hmm. And Sifu Lang Teng is still very shady as to whether he is 11th or not right because by taking the 11th he kind of has to give up the ghost which he doesn't want to he just cannot let go so the answer to this was embedded in his ranking system but he did not hold to it so now he's created a bit of a pickle all right <laughs> so uh he could say and i'm sure that he does justify it in some kind of way that he could have multiple tenths or multiple ninths for different countries. So instead of saying there's going to be one unified head of all WT, he, he would, for example, have an American uh, grand, an American tenth level, let's just say, uh, a European one, an Eastern European one, and one in Hong Kong, um, which is actually a pretty sensible thing to do. But you know that the moment that Sifu Leung Ting, you know, and again, this is not wishing him to pass away. This is a hypothetical. You know that the moment he passes away, that if there were a 10th level in the U.S., which there's not. No one in the U.S. is close to being that. And um, I hope Sifu Lang Ting seriously does not consider giving certain people in Texas uh, gold stripes, okay? Because that, that would be an absolute embarrassment. Um, people who don't even know the chasing program or, or don't know basics, it's like, no, 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 no. Don't give that guy the, the, the gold stripes. Um, so, but let's just say he had an American 10th or 9th. He has a couple European guys and he's got a guy in Hong Kong. You know the moment he passes away, 
none of those guys are going to work with each other. Yeah, you of know course. that. Absolutely. I mean, come on. They, we, we only need to look at history to understand this. There's going to be no, there's going to be very briefly after he would pass away, there would be a kind of like, hey, you know, we should, you know, we should keep things unified for Sifu and do this or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, sure. I'll text you. We'll stay in touch. And then, you know, that kind of ends at the funeral. Mm hmm. And then, you know, a few years back, well, actually, the guy in Europe didn't really learn this. And the guy in Europe, well, actually, the guy in States was fast-tracked to be a grandmaster. Actually, the guy in, and then it, it, that, 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 and then it's a four-way schism, mm -hmm. all right? Yeah. So, I mean, let, let's not pretend that even if Siva Langting wrote a freaking decree that these guys have to get along, which he never would. He likes his students not getting along. There's something very Machiavellian in the way he treats his senior students. He thinks that if he gets them to fight with each other, they're going to kind of be competing to be more successful. Because, you know, like if they're competing with each other, they're competing for more students. Right. And then, and then so he thinks that that's going to, that's the, the rising tide that raises all ships. But what he doesn't realize is he's just making all of his own guys eat each other. Yeah. And he's just destroying his own association with internal politics. Mm -hmm. And to think that after he passes away, this isn't going to be um, levels or worse than it is right now is, is just not, not taking five minutes to think about it. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be an absolute hot mess after he passes away. Um, because... You know, let's be honest, in the EWTO in Europe, Sifu Kanspecht, he's, he's kind of, he's gone his own way. Yeah. They still have classical Wing Chun in the EWTO, taught mostly through my Sihing Giuseppe Scambri, so you still can get it. But the EWTO on the whole has decided to develop its Wing Chun in another direction, which I think is great. I think you, you do need to develop the art further. I think that's part of our responsibility is not just to pass on that traditional ball, but to improve it for the next generation, right? Uh, Hungary, where he has Sifu Norbert, that's a very limited scope of the kingdom. And within Sifu Norbert's association, I, I don't know if, if, I don't know how, if people are going to really want to stay with him if the old man is not around. Right. They're staying with him now because he's the pipeline to the old man. When the old man is not around, there are other options. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I think in Europe, I, 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 don't really, I don't really see there being any kind of huge continuity. I just, I just maybe in the EWTO. The EWTO uh, is, is the smartest of all of them in terms of, they, they might have a contingency plan for this, but I don't know. Um, in terms of the US, there's no one who's anywhere near a gold stripe level. Uh, so it would have to be one of the senior students. And again, once, once you're no longer the pipeline to the old man, then the only way you're going to keep students is if you're a good teacher. Yeah. And if you teach skillfully and you have a good vibe and a good school and people like going there. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of Sifu Leung Ting students in the U.S., if you took away their connection to Sifu Leung Ting, they're not particularly good instructors. They're not particularly successful. They're not even nice people. Yeah. Okay. So people are willing to put up with a lot of shit as long as they know that they can advance and they have a pipeline to the Wing Chun they want to learn. Yeah. When Sifu Leung Ting, if he passes away at some point, uh, while these guys are still kicking, um, they are no longer a pipeline to that. Yes. So now for the first time in their lives, they're going to have to stand on their own merits and their own merits are, um, are not strong. Yes. Okay. So I don't, I think the U S is just going to, the U S is just going to fragment as it already has. I mean, look, all the biggest instructors in the U S the most successful ones under the IWTA, me, uh, the late Sifu Elman Leung, Sifu Carson Lau, the list goes on. They've all left the IWTA years ago. Yeah. So all they have left are the, uh, you ever, you ever watch married with children? Yes. There was an episode, you know, cause they were always so broke and didn't have any food. Mm hmm. And uh, Al Bundy said he would occasionally eat toaster leavens, oh which were that one. which were the crumbs that got to the bottom of the toaster. Right, and you pull that out, and then you could put that together and eat that. So um, <laughs> the U.S. W.T. the people who are left, they're the toaster leavens. Wow. Of Leung Ting's once somewhat competent U.S. association. So the, the U.S. is just, it's already fragmented. No one, no one cares about the IWT in the U.S., and it's just going to get worse. Second, uh, Europe, EWTO might keep it together 
kind of post Leung Ting for sure. Um, Eastern Europe, not so sure. Hong Kong is the interesting one because it seems pretty clear that Sifu Leung Ting is grooming Robin as his kind of, Sifu Robin as his de facto successor. Uh -huh. And Robin's a great guy. I've met Robin before, even though he was just a rubber stamp for Sifu Leung Ting. He's the one that, Robin is the one that wrote the letter that said, I only learned from Sifu Leung Ting for one week, yeah. knowing full well that that wasn't true. <laughs> Robin is just a rubber stamp for Grandma Leung Ting. Grandma right. Leung Ting tells him to jump off a bridge and he says, Okay, fine. Yeah. Um, and, you know, how high or head first or feet first, right? Mm -hmm. And then Siva Lengting will yell at him for asking him more questions and he'll say fine and then just jump off the bridge. Um, <laughs> so I, 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 don't, I don't think Rob, Robin is a very skillful Wing Chun Sifu. He speaks English really well, which right. is very important if you're going to be the head in Hong Kong. Yeah. Because then you're also kind of the de facto head of Leung Ting's entire association. Yes. But he doesn't have the charisma. He doesn't have the drive that, Sifu, that a young Siva Leung Ting had. So I don't know. I don't know if post Sifu Leung Ting, if people are going to go, yeah, let's get behind Robin. Right. I don't know. Maybe they will. Maybe he will change. Maybe he'll step it up in that point. I just don't see it right now. He just doesn't have that. He just doesn't have that drive, that charisma mm -hmm. that you need if you're going to be the head of one of these things. So um, it's an interesting question, but I think it's really one without answer. Well, I mean, I don't know. You know, this, this, it, we keep coming back to this Iron Fist thing. I mean, you're saying that the American situation could like fragment like 100%, but I don't know. I mean, the presence of someone that could just swoop in and make a triumphant return. Who's that? <laughs> it's Dre. No, I'm kidding. It's Dre. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, <clears throat> the U.S. Uh, the Siva Langting's association, especially the worldwide face of it. Um, not so much Europe, because Europe is very, EWGO is very professional. Whether, whether people agree with everything they do or not, they have their, uh, to say in a very American way, they have their shit together. Yeah, absolutely. They have a management team, advertising team, PR. Right. You know, they, 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 they got it together. They're the, they're, they're the exception to the rule. Um, and in order for the, co the countries that are directly under Sifu Leung Ting to thrive, they would have to completely restructure the way they do things. In the old days, the Sifu Leung Ting organization had a really good program. They were very professional. And they were a pipeline to this line of Wing Chun through Yip Man and so on and so forth. But nowadays in, in, in 2023, in the 21st century, it needs to be more. The entire project of running a martial arts association or a school in the 21st century has to be based on the benefits to the students. Okay? It, it's... it's what have you done for me lately? It's what are you doing for me? When, I, when you go to the school, are you getting good training? Do you get benefits? Do you have the ability to train with other like-minded people? Is the program structured intelligently? Is there some kind of room for growth? Is the ranking system or advancement fair? It's about the student experience. Truthfully, it always was about the student experience. But in the old days, where you had these brand names they could kind of make the brand name the big thing. Cause it's like, well, you're here. Well, you get to learn this Leung Ching Wing Chun, this Wong Chun Leung Wing Chun, or this Wing Chun from this line or whatever. And now uh, you have so much competition, not just from other Wing Chun, but from other styles. No one is going like, well, I'm going to be able to put up with a lot of abusive political shit because it's the Leung Ting organization. I'm willing to put up with these arcane rules the association has because it's Leung Ting. Leung Ting doesn't have that reputation or that name anymore. It's not the 80s. So um, they would have to completely change how they think about stuff because they think, well, because of who we are, that's what matters. No, it doesn't matter who you are. It matters whether you care about the people who walk in the door. And the IWTA has always had a failing in that. If you ever want to feel like a total jackass, you ever, um, you, you remember uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure? Absolutely. When he walks into that bar. Yeah. And then everyone just kind of stops and looks at him. Mm -hmm. And then he goes up and everyone's looking at him like that. If you ever wanted to have a feeling of like what it's like when uh, Pee Wee Herman walked into that bar and everyone is just vibing him and looking at him like, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. Walk into the Leung Ting Gym at 440 Nathan Road in Hong Kong during class time and just see how unfriendly you'll be greeted by an instructor there. Uh -huh. If someone walks into our school here... Uh, even during class, we don't go like, oh, that person's interrupting our class. We go, hey, how are you doing? 
Uh, you interested in Wing Chun? I'll have someone talk to them, make an appointment for them to do an intro lesson, maybe give them a pamphlet, some information. And then we'll say, great, we'll see you on Saturday and so on and so forth, right? Walk into the Leung Ting gym, including my friends in Hong Kong who have been friends with Siva Leung Ting for years. And you just look at everyone's head turns and they look at you like, what are you doing here? <laughs> Why are you here? Maybe the person wants to inquire about classes and maybe looking at him like he's a piece of shit is not the first impression you want to give. So the IWTA in Hong Kong would have to completely change their attitude, would have to completely change their mindset for them to even remotely be relevant in, in the coming years. Yeah. So um, there is no conclusive answer, but it's not looking good. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, not to harp on about it, but like this is, it just strikes me that like, when including yourself when talking about people that actually left the organization and went off and did something you know kept but you're still teaching Lung Ting Wing Chun right. but like in a more kind of progressive like kind of successful business model yeah with a smile on your face yeah that's I've, the main thing <laughs> it was very I mean take, 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 take the angry shit eating <laughs> face off and put a smile on and that's I mean, the why difference why don't you just smile it makes yeah. you look pretty <laughs> right right <laughs> but seriously like at some point what, what where is it where is the line there? It's like if, if, if the American, just let's just say for the American organization, just falls to pieces, as it quite possibly might. It already has. The right. American Association is, is used, they have no, barely any students. Right. They've already failed. Ah, okay. Yeah. So in that case, then I guess yeah. it's a kind of a moot point because it's like, well, then, you know, why they can either come here or you can swoop in and you can tidy it up. Oh, I don't want them. <laughs> okay. Fair I, 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 I've tried. I've tried. I've tried teaching some of their strays. It's not right. easy, right? Um, because uh, to a certain degree, they, they're look the the whole idea of like kind of the hardcore Wing Chun gym. You know that that was the product of the seventies and eighties. It yeah. was a different mindset for martial arts, and it worked then. Nowadays. Kung Fu people or Wing Chun people were not the tough guys on the block. Those are the MMA and Jiu Jitsu guys. Yeah. No one wants to walk into a Kung Fu school and see a bunch of people acting like this. Like, bro, y the MMA guys are the tough guys on the block, right? Right. So you have to do something different. You have to be very welcoming. You have to welcome the people who maybe don't have the self-confidence to walk into an MMA or Jiu Jitsu gym. And you have to now be that school that they need. And they're not able to do that because they just want to talk about who they are, who they learn from, what rank they have, all this kind of super unimportant shit. Yeah. Um, and if I were to take them on, I have to decondition essentially the mindset of people who've been low-key abused for many years. Right. And a lot of these guys are really nice guys, but like sometimes I'll occasionally teach a Zoom lesson for someone in the IWTA in the U.S., and the stuff that they say about how they're learning, what they're learning or whatever, and like how sheepish they are about asking me questions because oh, wow. they're afraid I'm going to give them the answer of like, you're not effing qualified to even ask me that question. I remember the first time I taught in, uh, in uh, I'm not going to say where, but I taught in a foreign country where they were former IWTA people who had invited me. And I was like, um, great, uh, what do you want me to teach? Um, is it okay if you teach the Siunim Tao form and maybe some applications? Yeah, 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 of course. But you probably also have some Chumkyu level students or BUG or Wooden Dummy. You want me to teach them stuff? And they were like, you would teach BUG to BUG level people at a seminar without charging extra? I'm like, well, I mean, they pay for the seminar. Depending on what level you are, I'll teach you the material for your level. And they right. were like, they couldn't understand it because <laughs> the BUG would have to be taught in a special instructor seminar right. where they're going to have to pay all this extra money. Or I'm maybe going to have to have them pay me some fees extra just to teach them the BUG or the wooden dummy. And I'm like, no, no. And, and it was so funny because they were like, you know, they were like, um, I, I hate to use the analogy, but it was like taking, taking on children who come from an abusive household. Right. And they were almost paralyzed to ask me questions, afraid that uh, I was going to be upset with the question that they're going to ask me because, uh, oh, no, no, I can't say that. I can't teach that. Yeah. And you know me, I'm an open book. If you're qualified to learn something, if you're qualified to learn Buji, then when I teach you Buji, I'll teach you Buji completely and with my whole heart and not 
kind of do this hold back thing that they're so used to. Even when they're qualified to learn Buji, their Sifu still holds back 75%, most yeah. likely because they don't know that much to begin with and they're afraid of giving too much away. Right. So, um, no, I'm, I'm really not interested in teaching those guys or swooping in. There's also, quite frankly, not enough of the IWTA in the U.S. left for it to even be a good business decision to go like, oh, I'm going to take these people on to expand my association. There's not much expansion if you take those people on. Right. You're taking on people who are teaching out of a dance studio with three, four students on their best day with very little understanding of how to run a class, how to properly teach self-defense, the form, teach the theory. No, it would, I'd just rather teach. I'd rather a brand new beginner who is completely uncoordinated and even klutzy come and, and want to take five lessons with me a week and every day they're not making any progress because they're so klutzy. I would rather teach that person right. than, than try to reteach those guys from the IWTA. I just not, it's just not worth it. Okie dokie. Well, I will. There are other Sifus who'll do that. Sifu, Sifu Carson Lau has no problem doing stuff like that. I, I, uh, he's a much better man than I am in that category. <laughs> I, 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 don't have, I don't have the patience for it. I am going to somehow get you into some kind of Iron Fist scenario at some point. It's going to happen. Good. All right. Anyway. What, else, what else you got for me? <laughs> so if you're not local to NYC, one of the easiest ways for you to improve your Wing Chun training is to train online with me. Online private training is tailored toward the individual and geared towards serious practitioners who want to improve their skills or knowledge base. I offer two private lesson subscriptions, twice a month and four times a month. Kung Fu Genius listeners use the code KFG online to get one online consultation lesson free with the purchase of any subscription. That code and the links are in the description below. Online private training is a convenient way for you to ask any of the questions you've had about application, form, theory, or even how to teach. Bring a partner to train with you online at absolutely no extra cost. I'll show you how to train with your partner online. Again, use the code KFG online to get a free consultation lesson with the purchase of any online subscription. Links are in the description below. And I'll see you online. All right, we've got another Patreon um, from a personal favorite of mine, Chris Beery. All right. Um, we need to do a, K a KFG Hot Ones episode. Uh, is that the one where you eat the chicken wings and yeah. they gradually get hotter and hotter over yeah. time? Yep. I'm totally down with Me that. Me too. We, and we all have to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I like, I like spicy food, but I, I, I'm not like, but I definitely have my limits, but it would be kind of funny to be like tearing up and answering stuff. Hey, uh, well, is there a trademark problem if we just straight up copy that? <laughs> I mean, should, should we call it, not hot ones, sort of um, spicy things. Spicy things, yes. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> heated oons. I think in French, I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm also thinking, but it may be way too geek. You know, in, in Wing Chun, we have a, 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 a word uh, or a phrase. It's la sao. La, la sao is, is like when the, the hand is freed, right? Yeah. Like a la sao jek chong, right? Mm -hmm. And in Europe, la sao was like a, a type of sparring exercise that they did. But the Germans always pronounce wrong. They say lat so lat, and in Cantonese to be lat lat. It's short lat so lat yeah. so not lat so lat means spicy in Chinese. <laughs> so I remember like when I was learning in Germany and I was trying to get one of my Cantonese friends to like, oh, we're doing lat so. He's like lat. What, what does it even mean? I didn't realize it was lat so because I kept saying lat, and he's like spicy hand. What are you talking about? So, um, yeah, maybe we have to do our lot ones. <laughs> yeah, we could, we could definitely do that. I'm, I'm in. I might even take a camera on me for that one. Yeah, well, sure. If nice someone could set that one. up, have like some chicken wings of gradually increasing levels of spice. I have a very extensive uh, uh, hot sauce collection at my house. You do? I do. Okay, then I think we should do one with the three of us. You, yeah. me, Andre. Mm-hmm. And you know the actual, the, uh, the place that actually does all the hot sauces for that show is actually in Williamsburg. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's called The Heatonist. It's actually a really, really great hot sauce place. They like, have like Heatonist? A, yes, The Heatonist. Oh, that's so great. It's so good. And um, they have like the shop in the front of it. And then in the back, they have this massive kitchen. So it's all, so many of that stuff is like, it's like a... Like a tasting kitchen for hot uh -huh. sauce. Uh -huh. it's, wow. Um, yeah, wow. It's pretty fantastic. All right, let's do it. Let's okay, do cool. It. All right, and Chris, you got it at right. some point soon. All right. So um, anyway, next question. Let's go. Carlos Estrella. All right. Carlos in the house. Okay. Hi there, Sifu Richter. Well, she says, hello. Hello, Sifu Richter and the rest of the KFG crew. See, I'm already editorializing the questions. Oh, you're editor. Oh, <laughs> the way Dre usually cuts you guys out on purpose. Yeah, absolutely. You know, well, I, mean, I feel like we've got to have a little bit of his uh, vibe here while he's off gallivanting for his 48th birthday. 
Sigh. Anyway, um, maybe I missed an episode on this, but I'm very curious about the Wing Chun history of the New York City area. Who are the, uh, who are the OGs? That's OGs, Dre. <laughs> Cheeky! Of NYC Wing Chun, and who's still around? Not interested in the politics as much as longevity and the lineages represented, thanks. Uh huh. Um, well, that's a great question. I only know this stuff kind of secondhand because uh, in, in terms of the New York Wing Chun scene, although I've now been teaching for over 20 years, I'm still the Johnny come lately. Right. You know, because the New York Wing Chun scene, from what I understand, started in the early 70s, which is about the time most of the Wing Chun scene in the U.S. started anyway. Right. Bruce Lee was definitely an outlier, having come so early to the U.S. in the late 50s. And definitely can be argued that he was probably one of the first, if not the first, to teach Wing Chun stateside. I'm sure there was one or two other guys here and there. Um, but really, it was with the advent of Bruce Lee's Hong Kong films and that success that um, Wing Chun really started to get a lot of traction. Uh, I, I think in the 1960s, even if you were in a Chinatown, I think you'd be really hard pressed to find Wing Chun. So I think even though New York with its uh, population and also its Chinatown is probably on the forefront of that, um, I think most of the Wing Chun in the US, it, it, it is, has to be post 1970 anyway. So we're really talking about that time. Well, I think the OG of OGs for New York has got to be the late Moyet. Right. Uh, so New York uh, was very lucky in that way because Moyet was a very qualified and um, a close personal student of Grandmaster Yip Man. Uh, what a lot of people forget sometimes is that Moyet actually taught in Hong Kong for many years before he came to New York. So because there's this kind of um, assumption that all of the Moyet guys are all like New York trained Wing Chun guys. But Moyet had a school in Hong Kong even in the late 60s. We had like Tang Hua, Sunny Tang and a number of other students learned from him in Hong Kong uh, prior to coming to the U.S. But he was the first one, I think, to have a brick and mortar Wing Chun school there on East Broadway in Chinatown. Oh, wow. Like the ninth floor of some building there is a Moyat Wing Chun. And uh, I used to take people to go see it every time we were in Chinatown. Like, hey, that's one of the first, if not the first, Wing Chun school in New York. But ab about 10 years ago, um, it, 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 it's no longer there. Um, even Moyat passed away, I think, in 2000. Right. Um, so obviously his students or some of his students kept kept that place running for a while. But about 10 years ago, they stopped. So that's not there anymore. I can still show where the building is, but that was a kind of a pillar of New York Kung Fu. So I think Moyet was the OG. Then you also had Jason Lau, Jason Lau being a T1 student. Jason Lau came to New York, I think also in the 70s. Um, you had Chung Kwok Chow, who was a student of Nwa Sam, who was a student of Leung Sung, who came also very early. And then um, Duncan Leung was here for a little bit. And... Uh, was a bit of a rebel rouser. I think he liked to stir, stir some shit with the other Wing Chun people. Uh, some of my non-Wing Chun friends um, s said they didn't like Duncan Leung because they thought that he was kind of a bit of a troublemaker. But I don't, I don't, know, any, I don't know anything about him. Right. Um, he didn't stay in New York for too long. Then uh, there was uh, Alan Lee, who was a student of Lock Yu and also a student of Duncan Leung. Uh, he taught for a little bit. And then, uh, well, I shouldn't say taught for a little bit. He actually taught for quite a while. Um, William Cheung had some representatives here in New York, although William Cheung is not from New York, but William Cheung, I think pretty early on, had a number of representatives like Victor Parlotti and uh, Phil Redman and those guys who were teaching in New York from the very early days. And those are kind of the main guys. Um, there are some stories about squabbles between those schools, but this question specifically asked me not to talk about politics. Um, and then in WT, in my particular line, um, my Seabach, Alan Fong, taught WT here in the late 80s, early 90s for a little bit before he left or was kicked out of Siva Langting's association. And then um, he still taught, but very kind of haphazardly. So WT wasn't really strongly represented in New York for any period of time. And then Andrew Dreheim, who's a German instructor from the EWTO, he came in, the, I think, in the mid-90s and taught Wing Chun for a few years. And then he left. And then um, some of his students took over. And then when Emin left the association, uh, Dreheim's ex-students stayed with Emin, and then I became the new Lang Ting guy in 2002. And right. that's kind of WT in... New York in a nutshell. The other styles, 
I don't know too much. Uh, besides me, there's also uh, Sifu William Kwok from Practical Wing Chun, student of Wan Kam Leung, who's been teaching for a number of years, also a good friend of mine. We seem to be the two main guys teaching in real brick and mortar locations. There's plenty of guys meeting in parks just to slap each other around and not really train constructively or, or in my opinion, step by step or learn something properly. But I don't really consider those schools. Right. Um, Wing Chun is unfortunately rife with people who don't want to learn step by step. They just want to like learn chi sao really quickly and just slap each other in the park and yeah. then and then think that oh well this is my own truth and no one is telling them that they're doing it wrong <laughs> and if they're stronger than their partner and can bully through their partner then they their confirmation biases then their wing chun must be good mm -hmm. um, but I don't consider those schools um, and that's it yeah I said, yeah I once knew this uh, oh, I knew like an acquaintance from my night lifetime I think I even showed you a video he posted on Instagram once. Like so many of those nightlife people, he they would they here I did martial arts and they'd be like, oh wow, you know what do you do? You do Wing Chun, cool. I do this, that, blah blah blah. And he was telling me how I did kung fu, and he showed me his wooden dummy form. Mm. And honestly, I thought it was a joke. Uh huh. Like he he and he just it was like just lots of palm strikes, but nothing else. And he was just like kind of stepping around. And then the, I think the video ended up showing. I don't know if you remember it because I remember you being very angry. <laughs> I agree. That's a weird re reaction for me. I normally don't care about those things. Well, because it was just, he was, you were just like, just like, it was kind of offensive because uh -huh. he was, it was like, I, 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 he posted it to Instagram, one of his stories of kind of like, hey, I'm going to just show you my Kung Fu skills, right? And it, his wooden dummy wasn't even, it was in his room. There was like clothes everywhere. And it wasn't even like nailed down or to mm. anything. So as he's doing it, you're just watching the dummy move around the right. floor. It was just like, it's like, like, is this a joke? And I'm like, it's not a joke. Well, th that's a problem because, I mean, on one hand, the wooden dummy is just a training tool to train on. The wooden dummy is in the same category as the heavy bags hanging on the wall. It is just mm. something you can go on and train. So, I mean, but if we're talking about Wing Chun, there's a, there's a specific method on how to do it. The angles, the position, the timing. How do you stick? When do you not stick? What, what is the position of the elbow? And... People don't want to go through the steps to actually learn that properly. They'd rather just watch Jackie Chan on Rumble in the Bronx and then copy that and be like, yeah, this is my truth on the wooden dummy. <laughs> even though what they don't realize is like, well, you're not even sticking when yeah. you're doing those slappy movements there. You're not even doing something that makes logical sense. Mm -hmm. And these are these Kung Fu people are always the people who never actually learn from a proper Sifu. And uh, they can then get away with it because they're saying, well, this is my interpretation as if somehow saying their interpretation of something simultaneously means that what they're doing is good it's like no you're just doing a bunch of untrained shit on the wooden dummy yeah. it's the same thing like if i put a pair of boxing gloves on and i just start hitting the heavy bag like this and going this is my boxing <laughs> all right okay and then a boxing coach would look at that and be like uh but those are not people who want to have a boxing coach tell them hey you're holding your hands wrong yeah. If you, you have to keep your hands here, you have to turn this way here, you have to raise your shoulder. They don't want to be told that they're doing something wrong. They just want to go and hit the bag this way here and say, this is my boxing. These guys who slap the wooden dummy around and do that stuff don't want to be told, hey, you're not standing the right way. Your posture is incorrect. You're not even sticking to the dummy. You can't do a tan style like this. You would get hit. They don't want to be told that because they don't want to be corrected. They just yeah. want to be the guy on the dummy. Mm -hmm. And so, unfortunately the lack of standardization in Wing Chun has given rise to these con men yeah. who have deluded themselves as well. Mm -hmm. All right, what else you got? <laughs> On that sexy bombshell. Um, John Day. Question. What does Sifu Richter know about Zhang Shi, Chinese hopping zombies? Ooh. Oh, that's a great... In parentheses. Jiang Shi. Uh, yeah, Gong Xi, I think, in Cantonese. Gong right. uh, Okay. Yeah. So I know my question... We don't, we don't speak Mandarin on the KFG podcast. <laughs> All right. Like when people say Wing Chun, Qi Gong. It's like Wing Chun, Cantonese, Qi Gong, Mandarin. All right? It's like, it, it's, it's like speaking half in Spanish and half in Italian. It's like, <laughs> no, 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 no. Keep it consistent. Well, uh, thank you for listening to the KFG's TED Talk. Right. Um... I know my question doesn't highly pertain to Wing Chun, but I'm just curious. I'm familiar with the Mr. Vampire movies. Thanks for considering. I'd also be curious to hear more about how Daughters of Han could be made. My thought is get Shannon Lee in parentheses 
to play the lead protagonist. No. I think she's been in like one and a half movies. Yeah, if you want anything to be good, keep Shannon Lee as far away from it as possible. Yes. Um, Especially anything pertaining her father. Maybe she's really good at directing, I don't know, British period pieces Directing or whatever, traffic. right? Directing traffic, right? But the, <laughs> if it has anything to do with her father, um, no. Let's let's keep let's keep Shannon as far away from that as possible. Um, there are other people out there who are far more there who are real experts about her father and probably have a better vision of that stuff than she's got a very narrow vision of how her father should be presented. Uh, Bruce T. Johnny Walker. Um, so um, anyway, yeah, uh, Bruce Gee would have been good. <laughs> so. Um, the Chinese hopping vampires or hopping zombies, a Gangsi, right? Um, this is something that really was made popular by the Mr. Vampire film with, with the late great Lam Cheng Ying. Um, but these kind of Chinese, the Chinese vampires are really a cross between like what we would call in the Western world, a zombie, like a reanimated corpse and a ghost. Right. All right. So it, it, it's it's not our idea of a vampire, right. even though they call them vampires, just because they're. It's interesting that a lot of different cultures have very similar things, but they they are a little bit different. Mm-hmm. So the um, you know, if if you haven't had a chance to see Mr. Vampire, it's a, a film from the early '80s, early mid '80s with Lam Ching Ying. It's a comedy horror. It's not really scary. I don't think anyone's really going to be that scared. Um, but it's basically he's kind of like a Taoist priest who has to fight these things, right? And if you use, you know, you, you, you write these characters in, uh, on, a, on, a, on a piece of paper and you stick it on their head, you can stop them from coming at you. And the, um, the Chinese hopping ghost or the hopping vampire, if I can use you, I apologize for those of you who are listening to us on audio, but if I use this mm, cell phone case here, right? Uh, Chinese hopping vampire is basically a reanimated corpse usually dressed in kind of a Qing official uh, uh, clothing. Wow. With the hat. I mean, they all look like Manchu officials, right? Whether, that was what, <laughs> whether that's what they always buried them in at that time or whether it was just, I, I don't know, but they're always wearing like the long blue robe with the hat and everything like that, right? So the idea is that when they come out of their coffin, they go from a completely flat lying position to a completely vertical position without any bend in their joints. Oh. So, so they're kind of like, they, they don't stand up. They're, they're actually floating off the ground. Right. And they're up completely vertical. And when they walk towards you, they don't physically walk with one leg and then the other. They kind of, I guess the best way to describe it would be float hop. Right. Because since they're not touching the ground, their feet never touch the ground. And they move vertically like this. <laughs> without touching the ground and they have their arms forward yeah. in a kind of zombie like thing and they're kind of floating like this and they come at you and uh, of course if they you know catch you they're going to kill you and presumably turn you into one of them uh, and there's lots of superstitions about these things and lots of really great movies encounters of a spooky kind with Sammo Hung these kind of Chinese uh, zombies Chinese vampires are ubiquitous among the horror genre now the interesting thing is that the genesis of those creatures is actually based on something somewhat historical. Okay? Uh, Nothing mystical, nothing uh, nothing regarding superstition or uh, or directly, I should say, uh, or or the supernatural. But uh, supposedly, um, actually according to a movie Sifu Leung Ting made a very long time ago, I think it was called, it's called, it's a mad, 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 mad kung fu world. Uh, he actually had this weird interlude in there where he talked about it. I believe it was in there. My memory serves me correctly. And during that time period, so I'm going to assume this is the Qing dynasty. Uh, one of the ways they would have to transport a number of bodies was yeah. as follows. Um, let's say they had five corpses they need to uh, transfer. The Chinese are very superstitious about the handling of dead bodies and um, even even to this day in Hong Kong if you have a job that that handles death or dead people you, you, you usually have to do a bunch of things from a spiritual or superstitious front to kind of cleanse yourself before you go back into the, your normal job. Yeah. The types of clothes you wear while you're on the job handling dead bodies uh, they're very superstitious about it. Right. The late Sifu Tam Hung Fun, who was a Wing Chun instructor, he was 
uh, a hearse driver in Hong Kong. He basically drove the car yeah. with the dead bodies, and, and he was considered like, Ugh, uh, why, would, <laughs> why would anyone want to do that job? All the funeral homes in Hong Kong uh, are generally in one area. Right. Um, uh, be, because they, they, they don't want... They don't want them parsed out all over the place. So they, there's one section of Hong Kong is nothing but funeral homes. Uh, I mean, of course, there are funeral homes throughout Hong Kong, but like they try to keep them in one kind of area for the most part. Right. So uh, one of the ways that they supposedly transported dead bodies in the Qing dynasty, especially when there were a few of them, rather than having them all in coffins, or maybe they're transporting them to the place where the coffins are. So for whatever reason, they're not in coffins at this time period. Yeah is they would take two very long poles, like think like the Wing Chun poles, except maybe even longer and not tapered, just like straight all the way through. And they would have a slit in the arms. So the corpses would all be wearing those, you know, those like Chang Sam gowns. Yeah. And they would have a cut right underneath the armpit on, on both of them. And they, you, they would run the pole uh, through that hole in the armpit under the arm forward this way here. Yeah. So the corpse would be propped up by its own arms outstretched on a pole like this. Mm -hmm. One pole on the left arm, one pole on the right arm. And then they would put the next corpse right in front of that one. Same thing through the arms this way here. So because they were superstitious, you would have, then have two guys, one on each end holding two po of the poles on his shoulders, yeah. and the guy in the front holding the two poles on his shoulders. Because they're dealing with the dead, they're dealing with superstition, the two guys in the front and the back would wear the same clothing that the corpses were wearing. Right. So it would look like if you had five bodies on the pole, well, then you had seven because you had got the guy in the front and the guy in the back dressed the same. <laughs> and everyone knew. And then what they would do is they would put it on their shoulders and then they would stand up. And then, of course, since they're standing up, all the corpses, their feet would be a little off the ground. OK, That's so why? So those five corpses on the bottom would be like that because they would be not maybe right on the shoulder, they would actually hold it up a little bit. So they yeah. would be propped up. Mm hmm. And then the two guys on each end would kind of walk in almost like um, uh, in the almost like a goose step, like a military goose step. Yeah. And so those five corpses on the poles would would be doing this up and down, up and down without their feet touching the floor. Right. And this is how they transported the bodies. And then if there was a guard going into town or whatever, they knew because these were dead bodies, they wouldn't even look. Right. So they would see this figure and they would only transport them at night. Mm -hmm. So at nighttime, they would be essentially these floating bodies going up and down, <laughs> of course, propped up by the two guys who were in the front and in the back. Yeah. And supposedly that's the genesis of the Chinese hopping ghost. Oh, wow. Um, whether or not that's true or that's like, a, like an old wives tale or a hearsay as to how that came to be. Um, remains to be seen. I'm sure there are people out there who know better than me, but that's the story I heard. Uh, it seems somewhat plausible. Yeah. Um, but if it's not, it still makes a hell of a story. Until someone tells me a better or more plausible one, I'm sticking with that one. That's fair. All right. So what else we got? Okay. Uh, another question here we got. We got um, JPS Steve Shanahan. All right. Or as Dre would say, JP Steve Shanahan. <laughs> Something oh, like that. by the way, I have to say this. Um, there's a, uh, a, a, a customer at, well, from our uh, online shop. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say his name because I'm sure he, he wouldn't mind it. His name is Mike Best. And uh, he, uh, he ordered a book from us. And then, uh, you know, there was some back and forth correspondence between him and, and my, my head oh, office. Yeah, this is great. And uh, so apparently, uh, you know, he had he had ordered a uh, signed copy, but like our, our shipping team mistakenly sent him like an unsigned copy. And we we're like, oh, we're sorry. We'll we'll send you out that signed copy, you know, and, and take care of it. He's like, oh, no, 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 don't worry. Keep the extra five bucks for diction lessons for Dre. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was great. We said, you said that in the group chat. I thought that was really funny. <laughs> so anyway, what do we got here? All right. So Steve Shanahan, JPS Steve Shanahan. Sivu! Exclamation Yo. mark. I literally just dreamt that I was training jujitsu in your school. You complimented the way I knew how to tie my belt and there was a stage for some reason. And Dre was singing along with other performers in front of the students. Wow. What a dream. 
But I, I can somehow imagine that that they might actually come at City Wing Chun. I, I think so, too. Yeah. I mean, look, we've got the speakers and I can set up the karaoke. Right, right. I, I, you know, I think that's going to be my Yeah. Although as a, as a former karate practitioner, I actually do take issue with the way the jujitsu guys tie their belts. <laughs> um, in, uh, in karate, we had a very specific way you're supposed to tie your belt. You know, the, the belt's supposed to go, you know, from the front around the back and then you tie it in a knot in the front. But in... in in karate, you usually tie it in such a way where you can only see because basically the belt kind of goes around your waist twice. Yes. But the way you do it in karate is so that you only see the the belt on the outside. The belt that's underneath is perfectly behind the front. You know, the the, the first layer is perfectly behind the second layer. Right. So you only see the one layer. Jiu-jitsu guys aren't like that. They just kind of wrap the thing around and then just tie it. Any they have a specific way of tying it, but it always bugs me because it's like it, it, when I practiced uh, jiu-jitsu in a gi with my with uh, you know the various schools I practice at, their belts always come undone. Mm-hmm. And my belt, because I tie it the karate way, never comes undone. <laughs> and look at the jiu-jitsu guys, they're always halfway, they, they have one five-minute match, they gotta go, they gotta put the gi back together, they gotta retie their belt. And I'm like, uh, I can't just, but in jiu-jitsu, they have a specific way of tying it, which is the worst way of tying it for jiu-jitsu. Right. Tie your belt the karate way, and that thing won't come undone 18 times during class. So anyway. Okay. Well, he uh, does actually have a question to okay. go with it. He says, uh, uh, I know, and I think that must be something weird with there. I don't know. But anyway, it says, but my question is, do you teach Wing Chun exclusively, or do you focus on other disciplines as well? P.S. Looking forward to this week's episode. Uh, yeah, only teach Wing Chun. That's all I know. Um, I enrich my uh, my own training by training with people from other styles and learning about different ways of handling and cracking the nut of combat. But uh, I do it with the idea of improving what I teach here, improving the training protocols for my students, not with the idea of teaching other things. If there's something else that I want taught to my students that I think is of value, I usually bring in an expert in right. there. Now, occasionally I do teach some stuff from other styles. Uh, when I want my students to know how to fight against it. And then it also includes some Chinese Kung Fu style. So I do occasionally teach some basic weapon seminars, how to use like spear or broadsword. And my knowledge in those weapons is very, very basic. But I want that when the students learn the Bacham Do, they have at least a working knowledge of how some of the other weapons work so that they can better learn to fight against it because they at least know how a spear is supposed to, what someone with a spear is going to try to do as opposed to just doing the, the big dumb attack that everyone does. So, right. Yeah. Okay, fair mm-hmm. play. So um, we got time for a couple more? We got time for a couple more, yeah. Okay, cool. All right, then. Um, let me see. This one looks. Uh, this one has been edited. I don't know if you're going ready for it. Long one, medium one? Okay, well, let's go for the long one. The long ones usually are mo- mostly just people talking, and then there's a one question at the end, if there's even a question. I think this might be one of those. Okay. But, but although I haven't said it, it could also be multiple questions. All right, let's see. Let's find out, okay? Josiah S. Vertiz, 2080-02. Since you know about these things, the Chinese character that Bruce's ghost wrote in, no retreat, no surrender. I oh, see, this is, see, there's these gaps. What is this, 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 syn- not syntax. Can't think of the word. You know what? I'm carrying on. No retreat, no surrender. When he first appeared to teach Jason in that old house, uh-huh. before he told him about his cup being too full, on a white wall or canvas, he took something black and right, ru- black and wrote a character Wu in parentheses is that where Wushu comes from he said meant martial arts he said it was made up of two other characters Chi parentheses maybe from Tai Chi plus this character Gua I guess from Bakwa in parentheses I saw that same character on a photo of Bruce from the movie Fist of Fury slash Chinese connection he was in his white uniform standing in front of a wall that had had that symbol so is that a Chinese or Japanese word? Does it mean to stop force or martial arts, to stop someone from hurting you for defense only and not for attack? I think that symbol was in the Japanese dojo in that Bruce Lee movie. Or was that just made up for the movie? Um, okay. Well, there's a lot to unpack there. It's a mm-hmm. lot of linguistic stuff. Um, well, it's always funny taking... Formatting! Yeah. That was the word I was yes. looking for. It's always, it's, it's always difficult trying to get people to not take movies as instructionals. Right. Um, 
a 1980s movie which has breakdancing and the ghost of Bruce Lee might not be the best movie to like, I don't know, learn martial arts philosophy from, right? Um, first of all, one thing that annoyed me about No Retreat, No Surrender, which I still think is a great, silly movie, um, is that the Bruce Lee character uses Mandarin terms. Bruce Lee did not speak Mandarin. Let's just get this straight. He spoke as he said in the Pierre Burton interview, first of all, I only speak Cantonese, all right? Uh, so that character, Wu, means martial, all right? And yes, it's the Wu of Wu Shu, which means martial art in Mandarin, all right? Bruce Lee did not speak Mandarin. That same character with Cantonese pronunciation would be Mo, okay? So it's actually Mo Sut, martial art in Cantonese. So, so if that guy was an accurate, it was accurately portraying Bruce Lee, which would be difficult because it was the, Korea, the late Korean actor, Kim Tai Chung, who most likely spoke neither Cantonese or Mandarin. Um, he would say, this character is Mo. All right? He wouldn't say Wu. All right? It's the same character. It's a different pronunciation. Right. Most Chinese characters are composites of other characters. They have different components. You have a radical which tells you what category this character belongs to. And then the other parts are usually little mini characters. And when you put them together, you create the whole character. The character of Mo, all right, Marshall or Wu in Mandarin, um, is comprised of a spear and the character to stop. So it's the methods to stop the spear, to stop violence. Right. Marshall. Yeah. Okay. To stop war, so to speak. That's the original etymology of that term. Um, but nowadays, it basically it does. It's not specifically limited to weapons and battlefield. It means martial, including martial arts like kickboxing. All right, right. which uh, or which is not a martial art about stopping the spear. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, so that character meaning has changed over time to just mean, as it means in English, martial. All right. In 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 all of its various applications of that word. So um, that's what it means. It should be pronounced woo. And yes, it's made up of. A spear and stop. The problem that Westerners have is they go, oh, he said this part is chi. That must be Tai Chi. No. All right. Um, and this is Kwa. Must be Bagua. Uh, no. Chinese is monosyllabic. If you say the tone differently, it's a different word. Right. Okay. So you don't know if it's Kwa, 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 or Kwa, Kwa, Kwa. You don't know that. You're just making an assumption with the few other Chinese words you know. Right. No, the word for stop. That old Chinese word has nothing to do with ba gua, all right? The martial art. It's not that gua, not even close. It's not even the same character. And that qi, meaning spear, is not the qi of tai chi, which is tai chi, zi, by the way, mm -hmm. and not qi as in internal power of force. So you have to not make any assumptions. You go, oh, this thing sounds like this, all right? Are you going to tell me that kung pao chicken has something to do with kung fu because it has kung in it? No, not the same character, not right. even a real Chinese dish that Chinese people eat. Mm -hmm. Do not make those assumptions. You would literally land flat on your face if you don't know Chinese. Besides the fact you don't even know, is this Mandarin or Cantonese? All yeah, right? right. So no, wrong on all those counts. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wu, Mandarin, Mo, Cantonese, comprised of stop the spear, but no one really cares about that. It just means Mo or Marshall. Right. Um, Japanese. All of their original characters are from Chinese. Right. The Japanese language has later gone on to develop other phonetic, uh, other alphabets. They have their own Japanese style of uh, characters. Plus, they have two other phonetic alphabets for foreign and other types of words. Right. Which are the ones that look more like just squiggles. That, yeah. That's how you can tell it's Japanese. But the original full-fleshed characters that they have in, in, in Japanese are from Chinese. And everyone knows, yeah, they're called kanji. Yeah, do you know what kanji means? Do you know how to translate kanji into um, Cantonese? Honji. Do you know what honji means? Chinese characters. Kanji means Chinese characters in Japanese. All right? It literally means that. So if you see that, and by the way, that character in Japanese is the Mo character, Marshall is pronounced Bu, like Budo or mm -hmm. Bujitsu. Yeah. Or the Budokan in Tokyo. It's that Marshall character. Right. All right. So you're looking at the same character used in different languages and contexts. 
So, uh, yeah, I know the photos you're talking of, that's most likely in the Japanese school, but they would mean it in Budo as in the martial way, all right? Yeah. Um, so it's the same character because the Japanese use Chinese characters, but those are Chinese characters, uh-huh. all right? And, okay. and, and very important not to do the whole Kung Pao chicken must somehow be related to Kung Fu because of Kung. Uh-huh. All right? Like, See. cannot make that mistake, all right? Okay. Or like Mushu pork must somehow have something to do with Wushu. All right. Is this mar- some kind of martial pork? All right. <laughs> no, it is not. And that's all I got to say about that. All right, everyone. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Kung Fu Genius. As always, don't forget to subscribe to the Kung Fu Genius. Hit that bell for notifications. And if you have any questions you want me to answer on a future episode of the Kung Fu Genius, just put those in the comments below. And as always, I'll see you guys next time. Word is I'm a kung fu genius Technique speaks for me, not lineage Forget Jet Li, cause I'm the one Many call me Sifu, but to you I'm Seagung And I produce masters, you surpassed us Your kung fu stiffer than corpse and caskets City Wing Chung is the house I built Violate the gate and your blood gets spilt Alex Richter, always the victor Hold on one moment Girls, I can totally hear you So can we drop the volume down a little bit so that um, my audience can just listen to the silky sounds of my voice? We have some special guests behind the curtain. We have some special guests. The girls are off school today, so now they're here (laughs) at the school with me. Mikey ran out of space. So right now he's got to delete a bunch of big booty videos off of his phone. No, not deleting the big booty videos. (laughs) The big booty videos stay. So that he could get on here and... Finish the second part of this video. <laughs> I spent a year here one afternoon. You sexy bean flicker. All right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from YouTube. Lots of gems, lots of Chinese hopping zombies, and lots of... Chinese hopping ghosts, wasn't it? Fucking hell. No, it says Chinese hopping zombies. Wow. On my own, managed to screw it up. What do you reckon? (laughs) Amazing. Lots of gems, lots of Chinese hopping ghosts, and lots of... No, you see... Do we do ghosts or zombies?